We're going to give people a little time to sign in and stuff. So if you guys want to keep talking about your aviation stuff. Yeah, there you go. Or we can keep talking about bacon. Yeah, Brian's kind of a wing nut too, you know. He is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's kind of geeking out talking about it. It was cute listening to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. We're still going to give people a couple minutes to sign in. But I can see you guys filing in here. Thanks for being here. All right. You guys don't want to keep talking? You were just talking it up before. Right. There you go. <laughs> I always love the bacon conversations. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So Brian and I were just discovered, we we're just talking. So Brian has a uh, a machinery's handbook from his grandfather back in what did you say, Brian? Thirty something? Well, he was he was it's from when he was in the uh, Air Force in World War Two. And he was a C forty seven uh crew chief and and uh he was the uh, line chief for the squadron but i have his that's crazy his right now. and now that i told you guys and so, cut you off as well yeah and that's here here's the latest version of that book yeah the same book that brian has that's Mine crazy. has 20 almost 2900 pages this has 1300 wow See, now I feel like we should Great reference this manual. later, though. Yeah, I feel like this is interesting enough. Right. We should talk about it later. All right, so hopefully everybody is in here. I'll go ahead and do a little introduction of the wonderful Mark Lynn, who is an SDI instructor. Um, you have, you've been an SDI instructor for about four years now, yeah? Is that right? I, yeah, I think it's about right. All right, it Three is. It, it is, I looked it up. <laughs> um, with oh, well over a decade um, of experience as a gunsmith, you're also a blacksmith. Yep. You write yep. for an aviation publication. You have an aviation service. You're a pilot. Um, what am I missing? All you're all all around bad mama jamma, and I love that you're so enthusiastic. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Janitor. Bad, janitor. Lots of keys. Um, and and I love how excited you are as, um, to be an instructor. I love I love how you feel about teaching and passing on knowledge. So we're going to get into some of that, but we're going to talk about what it means to be a machinist, um, how you can get the education you need, what you can do with it after it, and and some things that people might not think about when they're setting up a shop at home. So sure. so everybody, say hello to Mark Lynn. If, uh, if you're a student and you've been through some of the courses that he teaches, you probably already know him. But um, definitely feel free to use the Q&A because we are going to try to answer as many questions as you have. And um, you can use the chat, but for any questions you want to ask Mark, please use the Q&A there at the bottom. And, and there is Brian Dolch again, and I am Vanessa Boyer. Brian might pop in and out of here because that's what he likes to do. But... <laughs> Hello to everyone. So, Mark, you want to start off and just, you know, say some things? Sure. Well, thanks again, Vanessa. I appreciate it. Um, it's uh, it's always an excellent opportunity to have a chance to to uh, to share some different knowledge and that kind of thing. Um, love what SDI has done. Have been absolutely just, you know, happy as as being an instructor as well uh, for the past few years. And uh, you know, I'm real passionate about what I do. Um, anything from machine to making making things to, to making gun parts. So uh, just want to open this up as, as really, uh, like we discussed, as kind of a question and answer session. And uh, everybody has a lot of questions and, and, you know, setups. And, you know, if I buy that mill or I buy that lathe, you know, what do I need? How do I get it there? What kind of power do I need? Um, you know, those kind of things. So be more than happy just to kind of open this up as a forum and, Please feel free just to start, uh, pun intended, of course, firing over questions as you get them. Yeah, and if you have one, definitely pull the trigger and ask. That's them. true. That's absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's who's going to kick us off with the first question? Well, there is a question that says, is it hard to do gunsmith machining from Floyd? Is it is it hard to do gunsmith machining? Man, yeah. I mean, it takes it takes a number. I mean, it takes a, a you know a good a good base, obviously, of of machining to learn to learn the basics of machining, if you will, uh, to cut threads, to turn ODs, to turn IDs, to bore, to you know turn or you know. So, 
once those fundamental or rudimentary skills are, are obtained or are learned, uh, everything else just becomes a process. Right, for sure. Now, um, a question did come up in the chat that I saw, which I do recommend you guys use the Q&A so I see them when you, when you submit questions, but I wanted to ask this question anyway. I saw it pop up. Can you really learn machining online? Boy, that's the golden question. Isn't I love it? that question. <laughs> that's a great question, actually, too, Vanessa. And I'm sure you get, I'm sure it's, it's what question that's asked quite often. Absolutely, you can, because you know, while we're not, we don't have the opportunity or the ability to turn cranks and 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 turn knobs and and you know hands-on experience with the you know particular machines. Um, what we do have is the basis of the theory we do teach. Uh, so we do teach what's involved in milling, what's involved in turning, uh, what's involved in, you know, measuring hand tools and that kind of thing. And the process. So absolutely it is. And so I would, I always definitely encourage all my students to, you know, further their education. Find a local VOTEC or a local community college that does offer uh, the actual hands-on basic machining class, the intermediate machining class, and then obviously take them and or purchase their own equipment for their own shops. A lot of our students, I think, tend to become entrepreneurs and they start their own shops. And it's a real good way to, to learn is to go hands-on. Now let's get into that a little more, but beforehand, are you saying that people need to learn stuff before they're able to do it? I'm Boy, I'll tell you what, that's, that's, <laughs> that is the question, right? Yeah, right. Um, okay, so when you were talking about setting up your own shop in, you know, in your home, um, are there things that maybe a lot of people don't think about needing to do? If they're Absolutely, they are. And first, you know, one of the first things is, is, is finding that machine. While you can find machines new, you know, there are many, many manufacturers of new machines. I'm a particular fan of finding older motor equipment. As you'll see sitting behind me is a 1968 Bridgeport. And I'll tell you right now, it's hard to find, hard to beat uh, the old equipment. And I always like to equate this to the folks who say is, you know, this old equipment is temperamental and it's, it, it, it's, it has its own soul, if you will. Um, but, you know, to answer the question, yes, there are lots of facets um, to think about. First, how are you going to get the machine into the shop? Uh, this particular I'm going to bridge... I'm gonna pull up some pictures while you say this. Sure. This particular bridge port behind me weighs about 2,700 pounds. And, you know, an average garage, um, oh. you know, garage workshop that somebody might start in. Sorry, um, I'm on has, the wrong picture, but keep talking. Has limitations of, you know, weight and height and that kind of thing. So a traditional fork truck uh, is very difficult to try to load a machine into this, into a home shop. And a lot of times what you find yourself using is, is actual, you know, bars and rollers and things like that to actually move the equipment on the floor. You'll see right there in some of the photos I've got, uh, the RPC that, was, that we built, a um, uh, rotary phase converter to power the machine. So we're kind of getting off on a tangent here. To go back to the original question was to get the machine into the shop. You know, it's tough to use a traditional fork truck. It's tough to use... Um, heavy equipment to get in there. So you find yourself improvising using things like bars and rollers and that to get the machine into location. Uh, again, with the weight that these things weigh, you know, 2,700 to 3,500 pounds, um, you know, and they're, they're very top heavy. And, you know, you got to be careful getting them into position. Secondly is power requirements. You, you just had a photo there of the, like I said, RPC that we built, rotary phase converter. So the motor that's on the ground is actually the generator so you'll see the generator motor there and all of the boxes up to the left hand side the black box there is a bank of capacitors microfarad capacitors and what we do is we use those capacitors in an mcl to actually tickle uh, the third phase off of the generator motor that you see on the floor pretty complex uh, theory to kind of get involved over a webinar but Please, if people have specific questions as to how this works, I'm more than happy to answer emails or phone calls. So those are some things that, you know, kind of keep in mind is getting a machine in place, how do you power it, 
you know, 220 single, 223 phase. I have my entire shop here. Um, I have piped and wired, so I'm generating three phase power in this particular shop. My vertical bandsaw, which is a dual, is three phase, 220. My Nardini lathe is, is, is again, 220, and my Bridgeport mill is 223 phase. So. And, and you would suggest those four people starting out, don't, don't just get something to start out with because it's not going to last. Go ahead and, and, and get it. You know, the stuff. serious, yep, the serious, because, you know, the thing that you're going to spend is anywhere from 2500 to $5,000 on a Bridgeport mill, similar to what you see sitting behind me here. Um, and, you know, obviously 5,000 is kind of the, the, the higher end of it. You're going to get, you know, digital readout, which you see to the, you know, mounted off the machine. There's tooling, vices. I mean, the vice, the current vice that I have on this machine itself is about a $500 vice itself. Uh, end mills, fly cutters, um, all the tooling, collets, boring, you know, boring heads, boring bars, um, all the, you know, associated tooling. So there is quite a bit of stuff to go along with setting it up. But, Keep that in mind when you go to make the initial purchase. Mark, I had a, but you would have that question that popped up. associated with the first. The Mark, there's a question that actually popped up from Arval. Uh, can you explain one phase, two phase, and three phase electricity? Electricity. Yeah. So your standard most uh, your your standard uh, household current in the U.S. sixty hertz, two hundred and twenty volts. Uh, single phase okay these particular machines run on three phase power so you have three three phase three three hot legs or three 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 hot leg phases if you will that it requires for the motors to run um, to get into depth and how three phase actually works is, is going to be probably a little bit beyond the scope of this webinar Sure. Again, I'm more than happy to answer questions on it, um, but just keep in mind your standard household uh, current generally is 220 coming in at between 100 and 200 amps, single phase power. We need to convert that for these particular machines, not all, but the industrial surplus machines come in and they're generally three phase, 220, three phase uh, motors. Um, there's another question here from Alexander uh, Rivers. Uh, start starting out. What's the most important, a lathe or a mill for a small gunsmithing business? Man, I'll tell you what. That's a good question. It's a very it's a common question we get asked. Um, I would say either one. If I was going to be recommend for a beginner, uh, I would say a, a mill. I, I think a mill is is a very versatile machine. I think milling to learn milling is probably um, one of the e – either turning or milling is going to be a foundational or rudimentary skill, but probably milling would be an easier way to get going. And that kind of goes right into Jonathan's question of can I get away with a mini mill or the larger mill recommended to start out? My personal opinion is if you're going to buy a mill, I would buy a full-size mill. And what more is your, like, oh, go ahead. More than likely, you're going to get the mini millionaire, you know, man, I'll tell you what, it's got a lot of limitations to where if I had a full-size mill, I wouldn't have those limitations. Right. So, you know, as the old saying goes, buy once, cry once, um, or, you know, you could buy it twice. And cry, and cry twice. No. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And also, what kind of lathes do you recommend? Um, I have a fairly large lathe for the shop. I have a 15, 60 Nardini, so I have a 60 inch, 60 inch in length, bed length, and it can accommodate a 15 inch swing. So the 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 headstock will will accommodate a 15 inch uh, piece of material, which is a very large. But I do other things in my home shop as well that require larger, you know, a larger swing. That's why I have it. But I mean a standard, you know, 12, 13, 14 inch you know, 30 inches long, 40 inches long, uh, would probably be ample for most home shops. Actually larger than, you know, more than, more than, more than enough. Awesome. Right, I yeah. don't like to be limited. Oh, what was that? I said, I don't like to be limited. Yeah. No, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Right. Seem to have pretty much everything and you do everything. Correct. Yeah. Well, I like to think so anyhow. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> 
Awesome. So how did you get your start into machining? Wow. So <laughs> I started, uh, I started actually in the automotive sector. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I had a paper route, you know, back in the day, we didn't just flip on an iPad or a computer and a phone to look at, to, you know, get the news. What's a paper? That's right. Correct. Exactly. And so, you know, there was, there was local paper boys, but anyway, so I, I transitioned from being a paper boy, literally, um, to working for an automotive machine shop. Um, and I was lucky enough at 16 years old, I started, I started at the very bottom. I started sweeping, cleaning, painting, um, oiling, greasing machines. And then, you know, as a young man, you know, your interest starts getting peaked a little bit and going, man, what is that machine over there doing? And so you start watching and listening and, and, and learning more about it. Well, I ended up eventually segued into learning, how, learning the basics of, you know, milling heads, milling engine blocks. And it just kind of progressed. And I've always had a big passion or a big interest in the machine shop or the machining end of things. And all the way through high school, I continued to work in the machine shop, moved away from the, machine, the automotive machine shop into more of a manufacturing, traditional manufacturing, uh, operating big things, bigger, larger boring mills, uh, Bridgeport mills like behind me, Lays, uh, that kind of thing. But just kind of, I never really thought, I was a kid, I always wanted to be a pilot. You know, I was just a little kid growing up. You know, you know any red-blooded American kid, you know, see an airplane go overhead, you're looking up. But uh, I always wanted to be a pilot, but, you know, I got involved. In, and I was always into fabrication as a kid as well. I remember building a go-kart out, uh, out of an old tractor, you know, 13, 14 years old. Always tinkering with, with engines and with fabrication and welding. And always just had an interest in it. So that's kind of how I got my start in, in the machine. And, you know, I just progressed. And I've always stayed involved with machining to some level uh, most of my life. Uh, I don't remember too many years that went past that I didn't have my hands on a machine and stuff. So. That's awesome. And, you know, just, just like, you know, anybody else, you know, this is a trade that you're always learning. When, when you stop learning, you're dead because it's, there's always something. And I learn, I learn a lot from my students, believe it or not, from the good questions that my students ask. Um, you know, it makes you, begin to get you know deeper critical thought and so at, believe it or not a lot of questions a lot of that actually you know go gee I got to research that a little bit I never thought of that you know am I answering it clearly am I am I articulating my answer correctly and you know what could be a challenge is really what turns into being a, a larger way for me to learn as well so it's always you know every day is a school day as Gene Winfield would say Awesome. And I assume you have people that you can still reach out to who are your mentors and people like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, I reach out to them regularly. And I know that you are that to a lot of people as well. And that's, that's awesome. You betcha. Yeah. But you know, a mentor is a mentor. So, you know, that's, that's ment mentee, I guess, you know, and that's, that's the way I think you need to look at it. But, you know, always staying humble, always, always reading, always, you know, watching, watching other machinists, always trying something new. I mean, and nothing ventured is nothing, or is nothing ventured, nothing gained, right? So, um, yeah, you just, you got to keep pushing the limits and put, you know, more and, you know, more difficult things and, and that, so. And new technologies and the things they're coming out with. I mean, if you don't stay on top of it, you're behind. Yeah, and I use, you know, this, the stuff that I have here in the shop, you know, seems to be pretty antiquated to most people. And they go, you know, why don't I have a, a you know, a, a VMC or a, or a turning center or something like that in my shop. But, you know, I, I still run, I run uh, Fusion 360 um, for CAD programs. And I do at the local, our local community college here, we have a kind of a community, uh, what they call a fab lab. And so I mentor people there. We've got a couple of, we've got a hospital email mill there um, and been working with those guys, setting that machine up and getting things up and running and that kind of stuff. So, so I stay up with newer technology as well. Yeah. Awesome. Can you show but us? I do, prefer, uh -huh. I do prefer turning hand, hand wheels and knobs here in the, in the, uh, in the manual machine shop as well. So. Oh, for sure. Um, can you show us around your shop a little bit? I sure can. So behind me, you'll see my 68, uh, my 68 Bridgeport. Can you guys, can you see that? Okay. Yes. Vanessa? Yes. 
so that's that's kind of my uh you know that's that that there's the mill um and you can see uh we've got the you know kurt vice on the top um i've got some you know different odds and ends here you know i've got a you know, uh into call with a uh, indicator here to the to the right hand side of it, uh, but basic mill setup. Um, turning around, you see that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you back can up? You back a up. Bit? Yeah. How's that? And angle down a little bit. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. So this machine here is a 1953 Dual. I'm sorry, it's a 1957 Dual, and it actually has a uh, blade welder on it, and it's an old, dirty machine, but I'll tell you what, she uh, she just cuts a lot of metal, and again, the blade welder is handy to have. You you know, a lot of times you're getting into contouring tight radiuses and that, you'll end up breaking a blade and you weld it back together, so. That's awesome. Um, so that kind of ties into a, another question that we had from Jeff. Um, is there any advantage sure. for gunsmiths to learn and use CNC tools? Say that again, Brian. Sure. It, um, is there any advantage? Repeat the for question, general, Brian. Yep. Yeah. Is there is there any advantage for a general gunsmith to learn and use CNC tools? I think, you know, to begin with, I think it's, uh, you know, you're probably best suited to learning manual machining first. And then because, you know, CNCs are great for, for production, but it's a little bit overkill. My estimation, my opinion, other people have other different opinions. My opinion um, is the manual machine shop is going to be for the everyday gunsmith, unless you're going into production. Um, really, I think you're best suited with manual machines. The uh, CNC machines tend to be, again, they're great. They're, you know, it's newer technology, but there's more things to them. Obviously, you've got to draw things, you've got to program it, and then you've got to machine it. Um, again, has its pros and cons, but my opinion for, a, you know, average everyday gunsmith, manual machines are the best. Awesome. <clears throat> Super cool. Brian, you got another one? Yeah, there's there's if, a bunch on here. I was uh, gonna say, if not, I can start reading. Yeah, no. Um, we did have a question about uh, you know if doing the class. If uh, it, uh, David asks, how are we graded on the machine uh, if we aren't physically <laughs> machining? How are you graded? So how I grade is on obviously on the comprehension of the material of the theory. Um, and so it being, I like, you know, my opinion is uh, it's not just a standard cut and dry, um, you know, nothing against it, but it's not just a standard math class or a science class where there is necessarily a right and a wrong. It's more of a concept. Um, so we actually, I actually grade on the understanding of the concepts that we are teaching at that particular time. Does that make sense? For yeah. sure. Most definitely. Uh, we got another one from Jonathan. Um, what's the, th what is the theory on ample ventilation for your shop? Um, I have my doors open most of the time. And so we're in a co colder climate here as well. Um, in Michigan, I'm in Michigan. So we, I have a box fan that I use in the wintertime in a, in a smaller opening in the door to evacuate uh, dust um, and, you know, the mist and that kind of thing. But generally, if I'm not doing a lot of actually welding and if I'm not using a lot of flood coolant, there's really minimal uh, amount of dust and um, particulate that, uh, that really needs to be filtered out of here. <laughs> Uh, can I go back to um, the the course itself and you as an instructor? Can you kind of sure. walk us through the topics that'll be covered in the class and the and the base sure. behind how it works? Sure. So you know we cover the the text actually covers uh, milling, turning, 
Um, we get into some metallurgy. Uh, we get into some SOP, so standard operating procedures on running a machine shop, which, I mean, it's very, very important. In fact, we take care of that from the, you know, week number one. And so what I'm looking for there and, you know, on the discussion boards um, is concept. You know, what are we looking for for PPE? Are we encouraging that we use, you know, gloves in a, in a drill press? Absolutely not. You know, gloves have a very, very limited um, place in a machine shop. So we cover some shop, you know, operating procedures. Uh, we cover milling, we cover drilling, we cover, we touch on a little bit of welding, uh, a little bit of metallurgy, you know, heat treating. Um, but again, it, it gets pretty theory in depth and it's a good way, it's a good place to start, a good place to, you know, begin and coalesce upon, you know, as you progress through. Um, so we cover kind of all facets um, and not necessarily, we'll tie it back to gunsmith work, you know, threading the uh, threads for a muzzle break and this and that. The, the thing you have to understand is we want to keep it firearms focused, but we also need to make sure that what we're teaching is theory that will move into that, if that makes sense. Right. Because it applies to once, so many things. You can do so many things with it. After. Right. Because, I mean, boring is boring. <laughs> okay. And, and so once you learn the theories of boring, whether you're boring on a lathe or you're boring in a mill, um, you move that, you segue that into, okay, we're boring in a barrel or we're, you know, we're milling or we're turning or we're, you know, how, you know, uh, contouring or we're turning a barrel. I mean, these are all concepts we cover in the course. And what I'm looking for is the mastery of what things are. And, you know, obviously um, I have to work within parameters, but I try to be lenient as long as we're driving a point home, if that makes sense. Because, I mean, we could get very, very, very particular and very, very technical, but I don't think that does a student any good. I think it, it we need to look at the broad scope of it and dissect what they're saying. So it takes quite a bit of time to read discussion boards, to read assignment papers and to discern what are they trying to say? I mean, this current, you know, my current week students are, they're working on barrel turning and barrel contouring. 99% of the time students get the concept. They just need to say, Hey, make sure that we understand and i always point this out make sure that you understand that barrel turning is also reducing the od or the outside diameter of a barrel but i want them to go from just regurgitating what they're reading in the text to being able to understand the concept because they're never going to remember what the text said 10 years from now but they are going to remember what i said about some basics and some fundamentals and things the concepts of machining and although we're not training machinists in this course per se, it's a starting point, it's a stepping stone. So when they go to a community college or they go to a Votech center, when they when the instructor says, hey, we're, you know, we're gonna indicate we're gonna tram in the head of the mill, they're not lost. They go, you know what? I remember this instructor guy by the name of Mark Lynn, this crazy, this crazy guy, and and I remember him telling us about what tramming was and you know this, but they have a basic understanding. You know, and so obviously they want to to build upon uh, upon these skills. I hope that makes sense. It does. I told you guys he was enthusiastic. I get pretty God, passionate, I man. I get long winded. I apologize. No, I love it. That's I great. just want to make sure you know the biggest thing is the students understand the concepts, and that's that's the biggest thing. And you know what? We're I'm never afraid to answer a phone call. I'm definitely not afraid to answer an email or go into a long dissertation on a discussion board, you know, to make sure that a concept, I want to re reinforce the correct concept and eliminate the bad concept, if that makes sense. And even after they're out of your courses, you're still there for them, and that's pretty awesome. I had, I had a couple of former students that just reached out to me this past week with some questions. And these students are probably a year and a half, two years ago. So they're long gone past the students of mine. But I love it because the thing is, is that to me can show that I have had some sort of an impact of some of my knowledge that's passed through to my students that say, you know what, maybe this guy has an idea what he's talking about. And you do. 
All right, you got another question ready? Brian, if you're not muted. Yeah, <laughs> let's see here. Uh, let's see. Um, Where in Michigan are you? And would you be willing to teach someone local a few basics, especially if you're an SDI student? I added that last part. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so we're, we're about, we're in Muskegon, Michigan. Uh, we're about 35 miles due west of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, if it worked out, absolutely it would be. Yep. Good fishing up there. Very good salmon fishing. You bet. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So I do, have a, don't have salmon fish. I do have a good question from uh, Jeff Cochran. Uh, is there a material that is better for beginners to learn simple machining with, like screw threads, steel, aluminum? It's so aluminum. 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 It cuts easy. It can be a little bit more gummy. It cuts easier. It's easier when you're cutting tools. Um, yes, aluminum. I find aluminum is the, you know, some of the, that, you know, you know, it's, yes, by far, in my opinion, the best to learn on. And here this whole time, I thought it was pronounced aluminium. Yeah, aluminium. <laughs> if you're from the UK, it is. Yeah. Oh, is that where I got that from? I just thought I was being funny. <laughs> what are the SDI classes you teach? Uh, currently, it's what I teach is uh, is all machining. So uh, all machining all the time. It's what I live. Uh, it's what I breathe. It's whatever. So I've taught gunstock checkering. I've taught uh, uh, was it in, uh, I think firearm uh, troubleshooting, firearm troubleshooting. I've taught you know I've taught several other classes, but currently it's what I'm teaching is the uh, is FTT two thirty one. So awesome. Um, Mark, do you have any preferences on the cutting tools you normally use? Um, you know, in terms of brand, is that what's being asked? Um, I am not sure. Okay. So in terms of brand. Floyd, if you can reach out and let us know uh, sure. what exactly you mean. Yes, in terms of brand. Um, Gar, Weldon, um, Canamental. I've got, I've got kind of a Duke's mixture. I mean, those three are probably my favorite, though. Uh, I use quite a bit of kind of metal. I really do inserts, uh, carbide inserts and that kind of thing. Um, you know, welding for my solid end mills, um, you know, and gar tooling for anything in between. So, yep. Awesome. I'm not trying to endorse any one person or any one thing, but those are yeah. the three that work well in my shop. You know, I buy, I buy expensive and I buy good quality tooling, but I'm not changing my inserts out every time I cut something either. So. Inserts are expensive. I mean, expect to pay thirty to a hundred bucks for, you know, a box inserts. It's not cheap. So if you don't, have and to I still use money. quite a bit of. I still grind my own, especially turning tools and things, uh, for my lathe. I do use a lot of high speed steel, and I will turn. I will, you know, uh, grind and cut my own, um, you know, my own cutting tools, forming tools, and that kind of thing as well. So there are sometimes hard to beat the old fashioned method and still works, so. Super cool. And do you have a certain place that you purchase your tools from? I have a local supplier, Dick Dyke House here down the road. Uh, I've got a long standing relationship with these guys. Um, if I need something, even, you know, one of the supervisors there, if I need something after hours, within reason, he doesn't live too far from the store. Uh, he's been known to say, hey, you know, I'll get that for you on a Saturday at 2 o'clock after he's been, potentially has a few soda pops in him or something. He'll, uh, <laughs> in his he'll, drink. He'll run. He's been known to do that. So, yeah, so I use a local guy. I try to source everything locally when I can. Uh, I'm, a lo I'm a small business myself, and, and so I try to patronize uh, small business as well. So, For sure. And what are your thoughts on Grizzly machines? Um, you don't have to answer. Well, you know, um, as, as most of my students know, cause I'm always going to post this on the discussion boards of, have you ever considered looking at used industrial surplus machines like this mill that's yeah. older than I am sitting behind me here and definitely the old bandsaw that's way older than I am sitting over to the side of me here. So that's my opinion of that. And Although, I mean, there's nothing wrong with Grizzly. I think Grizzly makes a decent, I've never had 
you know, personal hands-on. There are some advantages. Grizzly does make a nice gunsmithing lathe from the reviews and some of the videos I've seen on it. I have never used one, um, but, you know, they've got some outboard things and some ways that you can mount spiders and things on the out outboard side of it. And there, there are some decent things in that. So would I be afraid to try one of those? No. I'm just pretty particular and, and stuck in my old school ways. I just go with old school equipment, so. And it looks so cool. <laughs> it's just ornery and it's just like me. It's very temperamental and it's stuck in its ways and it doesn't argue much. It just, you know, these machines have soul. That's what I can say. So speaking of old ornery guys, no, I mean machines. Um, right. If, if something <laughs> does go wrong with a machine, I, I would assume that there are less people around to come out and fix those things. What do you do? Um, you know, typically when you, when you, uh, you know, if you're going to own this type of machines, if you're going to, you know, obviously if you, if you buy something new, there's a level of a warranty. I don't know how that warranty works. Uh, I can't call Bridgeport is, they're no longer traditional Bridgeport. They're owned by a company called Hardinge now. Um, they, you know, you can get, you have to fix them yourself. How's that? Um, I've got to tear this head down. It's getting kind of noisy. It needs new bearings, full gear. It needs to go through the, basically the entire top, top of the head. But, um, yeah, you're going to be, you're going to be repairing things on your own. Typically this lathe that, that, uh, that I showed everybody here, um, this old Nardini lathe, I've had to have the, uh, this is an actual, it was this particular lathe was a Turkish built lathe. And this is a seventies vintage. I think it's a 73 or 74. But uh, I had to have the motor actually rewound in it. Um, so, you know, obviously out comes the motor and you send it to the motor shop, have it rewound and put it back in. So. so just know how to do that stuff if you're getting into old machines. Yeah, just, you know, be willing to learn. Yeah, yeah. I think so everybody gonna, on here is, so that's good. I got a question from Sebastian. Uh, how do you determine what materials uh, you use during a job and how do you acquire them? Boy, that's the million dollar question right there. Um, so I don't know of a good way. It, it takes time to learn materials. It takes time to learn uh, 4130s, 4140s, 1018s, miles. I mean, it, it, it takes time to learn material. There's no real good bulletproof way to say, hey, this is this particular alloy of machinery. It's, it's one of these things that you need to be around it for a while. Uh, oil impregnated brass. Uh, what do you use? What types of materials do you use typically for this particular application? If I don't know, again, like Vanessa said, I will reach out to mentors of mine. Um, you know, how hard was the rock? Well, what, I mean, what is all the, yeah, there's a lot of different ways. We don't always know. So sometimes it's trial and error. Um, other times we, we have a pretty good idea of what it is from past experience. And it's, again, it, it's nothing that you're going to know that after taking this particular class it's going to come with years of hands-on doing it to learn the material awesome and would community colleges allow us to make gun parts and what would we have to do to learn how to make suppressors um well i'm not going to comment on that last part never mind you have to be really quiet about it so. correct <laughs> So, I so like, you know, I, I can't answer. I know the local community college here um, would probably, well, obviously, they, you know, they're not an FFL. So, um, you know, you get into some legalities of that. And I really, I'm not a lawyer and I really don't want to give legal advice here. So I really want to shy away from this question. I would say do your research and make sure he, like, uh, hopefully Kip Carpenter's listening here. He's going to appreciate this one. But obey all, all, all laws. How's that? I'll leave yeah. it there. Man, if I've heard him say that once, I've heard him say it once. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So That's true. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, and I do know that I, I have talked to graduates who have gone to community colleges to do machining after, and they've been able to work on, on parts and things. Um, I don't know about the depressor part, but we do have a, a field study partner, Atlas Defense. And if you want to learn about making suppressors, that would be a field study to sign up for. But you betcha. Yep. Yeah. And and again, you know, what I yeah, I, I don't want to comment too much on yeah. that. 
Well, it's just suffice to say that Kay Baffle's suppressors are not uh, foreign to us. How's that? Yeah, yeah. All right. I got another one here from John. Uh, there's one gunsmith in my area, and he is not hiring or offering apprenticeships. What machining industries can I get experience in that give me valuable cross-training knowledge and experience? Get your hands on in any machine shop that you can. That's my advice. Um, I've even offered, I've even, I've even had students, I've, I've, same thing. Well, nobody's hiring a brand new guy that doesn't know, you know, you know what? If you want to do it bad enough, go to that shop or go to those shops and say, hey, guess what? Do me a favor. Can I sweep your floors for two weeks for free? Yep. And you know what? If that's the worst case, you know what? And, and after two weeks, if they won't hire you, what? You know, I don't tell you, but get your hands on, get hands on, get around it, get into shops. Um, it's all about proximity. For sure. That makes all the sense in the world. Now, um, and, and you know, if nothing else, Brian, too, and, and, I, and I know this, so kind of going back into the question about a mini mill. So, can I go to Harbor Freight and buy a mini mill for three to 500 bucks? Man, if that's the only way you can get into machining and get your hands on it, then do, do it. By all means, do it. Go spend three to 500 bucks on that machine, get it in your house, and watch YouTube. I mean, or contact me. I mean, somebody, but, but get, get your hands on somehow. It will all pay off and pay dividends to cross over into the gunsmith trade for sure. Awesome. And, and so working in this industry, I know you've worked with a lot of people that are well-known, yep. but does, does credibility and, and do connections, does that really matter? Absolutely, it does. Absolutely. It's like anything else. I mean, you know, anymore the way technology is and the way the world is and how, you know, how much access we have at our fingertips of things, um, you know, it's who you know. It really is who you know. Awesome, I figured. Do you want to name drop anybody? Because because who you work nope. with is pretty sweet. No, nope. um, <laughs> I can pull up. I can pull up a picture. Yeah, there you go. He's a good guy, by the way. Oh, it won't let me change it. it won't let you pull Stacy David off there. It will if I do it right. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Um. Yeah, so I was and so, and so also Vanessa too. I want to make mention that, and you've got some other photos. I do other things besides gunsmith and build 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 gun parts and, and machine gun parts. Um, you know, I fabricate uh, motorcycles uh, from the chassis up, so I bend the tubes and and you know and build the bike. So Stacy's been this guy here. Stacy Davis has been a great guy. Uh, he's standing. Him and I are standing behind us uh, or in front of Sergeant Rock there. You've probably seen Stacy David. He used to do a show called Trucks um, on the Power Block weekends. It used to be every weekend, every Saturday, Sunday. Um, and uh, he has his own show now called Gears. Yeah. Uh, get get uh, get on there. Get on the website and have a look at what he does. Anything to do. Anything that deals with motorized vehicles. But I've worked with Stacy on sheet metal shaping and fabrication, that kind of thing too. He can in fact, have. he's down. Vanessa, I think are you you're in you're down in near Tennessee, right? Is that correct? Near Tennessee? I am. So I'm you've heard of Franklin, Tennessee? Oh yeah. And you've heard of White House, Tennessee? Of course. So this so this Yankee's been down to White House and uh, Franklin quite a bit. The last time I saw Stacy, he moved to his new facility in White House. So Oh uh, yeah, they facility. I have I I am familiar. I actually know where they are. Believe it or not, address, Stacey, but I'm gonna stalk them. You should. And you know what, Stacy's a good guy. Stacy actually's from Utah. He he came to Nashville because he was he was trying to get a gig playing the guitar. <laughs> it's like so many others. And and he actually's a very good guitar player. But he ended up making it more in uh, fabrication and TV, you know, build shows. Wow. So. Well, if he made it doing that instead of guitar playing, that means he's a good guitar player. No, I'm just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's an interesting guy. So yep. Awesome. So is there anything that you want to close out with a little bit of, um, you know, advice or anything we didn't touch on that you really wanted to hit? We can do a part two if, if you know, we haven't really answered all the questions. Well, I'll tell you what, yeah, we could, you know, I'd be more than happy to do that if there was the interest out there to do it. Um, but I mean, get, get your hands on, get, get hands on any way you can get your hands on. 
Um, and, you know, it's all about fortitude and it's all about, um, you know, desire. Um, you know, remember the guy that gave up, you know, I, I don't, and I'm sure you don't either. Nope. So, you know, <laughs> get out of, you know, get, there's, there's always time. Yeah. We got to work eight, 10 hours days, but you know, after hours, instead of sitting in front of a television set, you know, try something new or you know, like I said, go sweep somebody's shop for, you know, give, get, you know, to give them an opportunity, give you an opportunity, you know, it, it, you know do what you got to do to get in front of it. I, I kind of have a, a question that you know, I just thought of, is there any associations these guys could get involved with without having any experience? Um, no, but there's quite a few, there's quite a few Facebook groups. Uh, there's Bridgeport Mill Group. There's, uh, you know, just uh, Home Machine Shop Group. There's a lot of Facebook groups, there's a lot of YouTube videos. Um, you know, as many of my students have, have always pointed out, hey, there's, uh, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's this person, there's that, you know, person on YouTube, so on and so forth. And, um, um, and so, you know, reach out and take a look. So Awesome. I don't know if you guys are reading it, but um, apparently a lot of people are interested in a part two. So, well, if we if we can do a part two, I would be more than happy, Vanessa and Brian, to do a part two. You know, and and uh, if there's a way to field, you know, questions ahead of it, um, you know, we could we could do it. Can we get a machining demo too? <laughs> I like that question. Yeah, yeah that's very possible. Um, you know, to do, to do a, a video or to do, you know, an interactive kind of thing, um, you know, a, a machining interactive, you know, video that's, that's very, very possible as well. So. Awesome. Well, we'll send out an email beforehand and we'll let everybody submit questions and, and anything we didn't get to, we'll try to get to then. I also. This series going demo, demo. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. Do we have and any other burning says, questions or we got to. We had a couple more, but. Um, thanks, Sebastian. The longer this webinar goes, the longer I don't have to be at work. I like that. Um, <laughs> most of them were more about, uh, like, still about the tools and about the course and stuff. Um, and we, I think we kind of, even if we didn't directly answer your question, I think we did touch on them in your answers. Okay. Um, let's see. I kind of like this open forum, you know, this format. Because I know, you know, just it's nice to throw a question out there and try to get an answer. So I want to try to answer as many as I can. Sure. Now that you mentioned YouTube, do you have any tutorial videos on YouTube? I don't. I, I you know, I've contemplated doing a YouTube channel. Um, I, I'll be honest. I don't. I just don't have a bit. I don't have the video. I'd, I'd have to. Well, I'd have to carve time out to do it. I would do it if there was a big. You know, I would be interested in doing it. I just haven't done it yet. How's that? Well, I will work on helping make that change. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah, we could definitely do that. I am on. I am on. You know, Instagram as well. I do post projects and things, airplane stuff, and you know, various other things that I'm involved in. I post on on, on Instagram. So. And what's but, your Instagram you know, handle? It's a uh, mal two five one six. All right. Awesome. And you know, the other thing too, Vanessa, is, you know, if people have questions, you know, you can put my email address out there as well. I'm more than happy to answer them. What, right. What's your Instagram handle? M-A-L, so Mike Alpha Lima, 2516. Cool. All right. Awesome. Does anybody have any other questions on the old machinery here? <laughs> No? No questions? Okay. Oh, we will have more. All right. Well, let's do this again soon. Thank you again so much, Mark. And thank you guys for, for being here and for asking all the questions. And we'll see you uh, at the part two. Excellent. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank I appreciate you, SDI holding this. So thanks. Yeah, don't forget to check out sdi.edu. If you are a student or a graduate, thanks so much for being here. Good to see you. Um, if you're not and you want more information, you can find it at sdi.edu. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. See ya.